which, which is part of what makes it phenomenal, phenomenal and difficult to study. But do you think there's an universal essence of creativity that makes it resonate, resonate with the human experience? Of anyone. Well, I didn't do this. Oh, um, so do you think there's a universal essence of creativity that makes it resonate with the human experience? Even though the definition is so broad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <It's a bird. laughs> well, do we, are we mic'd? Can you hear me? Oh, I think you can just pick up the um, yeah. Please, this? Yeah. Can you hear? Okay. You guys can begin now. I'll just get my. I think we have to pass that around. Um, oh, pass it around? Okay. So, <laughs> the universal essence of creativity that explains why it all res why it resonates with all of us so much? Yeah, or even though the definition is so broad, okay. it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours, so. yeah. Um that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so I don't know. Let me. I'm going to take a, some stabs at this. Let's see. So, uh, what's the definition of creativity? Um, so I really like what Dean had. Dean Simon had to say in his talk about this. <clears throat> Clearly, it involves novelty. We like novelty. Um, but it also involves some kind of value. The value varies from one domain to another. So in this, you know, in the arts. There's some kind of aesthetic value um, in technology. There's some sort of utility for the function of whatever is being invented. And, um, but apart from that, there's something in the creative process itself that I think speaks to uh, something in the human experience that I would describe as freedom, actually. So in order to produce something creative, it's not enough that it's just new and useful or valuable. This was Simon Tin's point. Um, it also matters how it was produced. So there are different ways of characterizing this point. He referred to like the process having to be heuristic rather than algorithmic. It's not just a matter of following prescribed rules or some mechanical procedure or routine. And precisely when you deviate from those things, um, you have to operate in a way that's completely open-ended and unpredictable and free. Um, so I think the, the creative process is like a really kind of profound and rich manifestation of human freedom, and that's something we care about, and that's part of why we care about creativity. You know, I, I, I have a problem that is called deafness. <laughs> I, I didn't hear a word you said, actually. If somebody could... <laughs> Which current problems do you think we need creativity for to solve the most right now? And do you think it, it suffices to simply trust in creativity? Which, which current problem to, that do we need the most creativity to solve? To oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I know what problems are, are getting the most attention. Um, mass data would be one, and security would be two. I'm not sure they shouldn't be in the opposite direction. Um, societally, I would put s security at the top of my list, uh, because I, I think we've effectively destroyed it up until this point. I think one of the problems that has been facing humanity since the inception, I'm not sure we'll ever solve it, is a problem of tribalism. The idea that <clears throat> we seem to be programmed to divide ourselves up into groups. Sometimes they're based on national identity, sometimes they're based on language, sometimes they're based on location, sometimes they're based on family, sometimes they're based on religion divide ourselves up into these groups and we war with each other because our loyalty is not to our species 
or to the planet, but to our group. I think as long as we're going to have tribalism as sort of almost a defining characteristic of human beings, uh, we're very likely to do ourselves in at some point. So I would love to see some creative solutions to that problem. I'm not sure I'm holding out any hope for any solution very soon. <laughs> Is creativity limited to humans, or can computers be creative? No, like I, 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 I tried to say this morning that um, I, I believed that creativity in my own in, in my own work is vested in a curious dual personality, um, comprised now of you might think of as two experts, one having to do with writing and manipulating programs and the other having to do with uh, mixing and manipulating paint. Um, fortunately, the two do correspond, but as I said this morning, they, they can't both work at the same time. So they are, I, I do feel they're quite distinct now. Um, can the computer be com creative on its own? Well, um, I, I think, uh, I. As I, as I said this morning, I, I've spent most of the last 40 years pursuing the notion that the computer could be creative on its own. And in the last five or six years, I've come to the conclusion that the human mind is so much more complex, so much more full of experience than the most complex computer ever used, the most complex program ever written, that I, I don't see it as a possibility in my own lifetime. Um, that's probably not a very long time. Um, but w when you think about what kinds of human experience go into the writing of the simplest poem, um, the, what kind of um, visual acuity goes into the making of the simplest drawing, the, the co computers are light years behind that. And I, I'm now fairly convinced that um, the, the history of science fiction notwithstanding, that the computer will never be a, a satisfactory imitation human being. That the computer certainly has an enormous role to play and has been playing over the last 50 years um, in human affairs. But the, 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 the science fiction model of the robot as imitation human being, I think, is a loser. And until we understand that the computer is an entirely different kind of entity um, to the human being, I think we're, we're moving down the wrong path. Mm. That's good news. <laughs> Dr. Klein, I'm very happy to hear that. I, I kind of like to think of creativity as the domain of, yay, human beings. Uh, but it, it is funny, I mean, during one of the talks this morning, I actually found myself anticipating that question, thinking, you know, depending on, upon the definition you give to creativity, can computers be creative? Um, again, I, I, I would like to think not. Computers are much better at certain things than we are, for example, playing chess. But uh, if a computer comes up with this absolutely incredible solution to a chess position, a chess situation, based on going through zillions of possibilities, just sort of through, through some algorithm and determining which one is, is the optimal one, is that, that creative? I, I, would, I would say it's not. So I would, uh, I, I'd be happy to, to have the, the 
decision for creativity come down in, in our camp? No, if I can add a word, um, I, I think there is the possibility that that um, very deep search that the computer can do that we can't may indeed generate another kind of creativity. Um, it's just that we haven't seen it yet. Um, I, 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 I said this morning that I thought of creativity with a capital C as only being present um, when the individual is modified by the act of creativity. When, you, when the individual finds himself in a different position vis-a-vis -vis the world and his understanding of it. Um, what I don't see is, you know, 40, 40 years ago we were talking about programs that could rewrite themselves and it never really happened. Um, all kinds of predictions were being made, they never really happened. Um, whether they will happen in the future, we don't know. But I didn't say that the computer couldn't do what we said, what we do. I said that the computer is not the same kind of entity as a human being. And I, I think the point you raise uh, about deep search as opposed to inspiration, yes. um, I, I think deep search may be a, the perfectly valid mode for creativity eventually for a computer. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had, thought um, you had your own there. Well, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting question whether um, computers could be creative. Um, it may be helpful to distinguish between two senses in which you can take that question. One is a question about something like a simulation. Um, whether a computer can perform behaviors that resemble human creativity in the sense of resulting in things that are new and interesting or valuable. Um, and, you know, thanks to innovators like Carol Cohen, we, we've seen that computers can do such things, maybe not nearly as impressively as human beings can yet. Mm. Um, but then there's a further question about whether in doing so, computers are being really creative. And this is perhaps what you meant by capital C creative. Like, are they just simulating creativity, as it were. So this, of course, analogous question to artificial intelligence about language processing. Um, one of the most famous contributors to that, de that debate is John Searle, who is a professor here at Berkeley, um, who argues that, um, contrary to some interpretations of the Turing test, even if a computer could fool a human being into thinking that it, too, was a human being carrying on a conversation, um, that doesn't mean that it actually has a mind or has thoughts. It's only acting as if it does. So you can ask the same kind of question about creativity. Um, I think what's one thing interesting to think about is, like, if you don't think a computer is created in its own right, maybe another way to think about it is as a kind of mental prosthetic. So just the way that you can extend your body with, like, you know, a prosthetic limb. You can extend your mind to an electronic device. So this is a thesis known as the Extended Mind Thesis due to the cognitive scientist um, Andy Clark and the philosopher um, David Chalmers. And so their notion is that um, you know, your, your iPhone, which carries all this, in, consults it for all this information, it's like a memory bank for you. And it functions as if it's integrated into your, your thinking and action the way that the memory stored in your own brain are, then it's essentially an extended part of your mind. So you can think of like a computer program that you design as maybe being an extended part of your mind that executes certain um, idea-producing functions, just the way that your subconscious might when you walk away from a program. And then you come back to it, and it produces something that surprises you. Maybe something you didn't think you could have thought of yourself. And that's kind of like a eureka moment that um, emerges from our own unconscious activity. It's, it happens to be in our own brains, but the fact that it's inside our skulls is irrelevant. Right, that's just, so that's just a different model to think about. It's like, it's not a computer as itself a mind, but it's an extension of yours. It's one option. So, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Step on your applause. <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, it, it, it kind of gets down
kind of, of, of a philosophical question. I like this kind of Turing uh, discussion. Of, yes, a, a computer could simulate creativity, um, and we could perhaps be fooled to think that it is creative. Um, but there's kind of a more fundamental question of could we uh, make a computer that's uh, creative, P perhaps? Why would we make a computer that's creative? <laughs> um, we do it so well. And uh, I think there's this, this problem of embodiment. And uh, I keep coming back to uh, the, the focus on the brain and the neural networks of creativity, but the fact that I'm talking with my hands, the fact that, uh, that, that, that we have these embodied brains, I think is critically important. It often gets lost in these conversations that there's something important about having this contact with the, with the sensory world and with this, this external world that the computer does not have yet, that I think may be a, a critical missing ingredient of that of, of that process. Uh, that there's not this this critical link with the external reality uh, that that might limit ever to <laughs> go along with what you're saying, ever being able to uh, bridge that gap uh, to having computers be creative. Um. Can we ask questions too? Is it? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, related to the question of whether computers can be creative, I wonder how about non human species on this planet other than, well, uh, dolphins, chimpanzees, dogs, crows, can they be creative? Yeah, so in my, and I'll talk a little louder. So, in my talk, I um, actually discussed. Uh, dolphin uh, creativity, and um, I, I think that if, if we're to discuss human creativity, we have to discuss it within the context of animal creativity and other species creativity. Why does creativity exist? It can't just be uh, uh, exist in the human mind. It has to exist in other species and across evolutionary time. There has to be a reason for this, this uh, capacity to have evolved uh, in, the, in the mind, in, in the brain. And it's not just our brain, but other brains that this capacity has to have emerged in for a, know, an adaptive reason. So to, to get at that, I think, is important. So it's really cool that we can do yeah. art and we can do music and we can do these wonderful things with our creative brains, but, but why is that? And, and how does it transmit through the different species and through different uh, periods of evolutionary time? I think that's really important to understand and not be both brain focused, but also not be human focused uh, in, in this endeavor. Super next question. Art and science are usually seen as being part of two totally separate fields, but nowadays we're bridging this gap and trying to illuminate the interdisciplinary connections they truly share. How do you propose that we connect these two fields with the concept of creativity? How do we connect art and science in the concept of creativity? Aren't we doing that here? <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. Art and science. Art. Um, because we see creativity as a very artistic um, concept almost. But how do you relate that back to science? How um, do you relate the creative aspect of art with science? I think that's the question. Um, OK, so. Uh, connections between art and science. So here's, here's, one, here's one thought. Um, let's take one example of important scientific finding. Uh, global warming, right? So we all know the facts. We know how quickly the glaciers are melting. We know that the level of the, uh, the sea level is rising. We know that the figures, it's really startling figures about you know, the temperatures. Um, and uh, we know that 98% of climate scientists attribute these alarming changes to human behavior, in particular to our consumption of fossil fuels. Um, but there are still people in power who think, who claim to not convince, and even those of us who are convinced sometimes don't change our behavior accordingly, we carry on the same kind of wasteful consumption and so forth, and I'm as guilty as this as, as anyone else. So. <laughs> Um, but so then the question is like, how do we persuade people when the data doesn't? And I think the answer is art. 
So um, there's an example of this I, I wrote about recently. Uh, uh, th this project called Bella Gaia, Beautiful World, um, founded by an artist named Kenji Williams, brilliant guy. He's a composer, a visual artist, and violinist. Um, and he puts on this presentation where he shows these, these videos from NASA. Somehow he got a hold, got a hold of this awesome NASA video, satellite footage of the Earth, which portrays the Earth in the most incredibly moving way. It's just like you see the whole thing in one, and it's, it's just like this, this one beautiful, blue, living, breathing thing. It's like it's got cardiovascular rhythms. It's like it, the, the, the winds are like breathing. It's, it's just, it looks amazing, and you feel moved by this. And you can also, the, these videos, like they chart, like um, you can actually see the rate of deforestation. You can see all these changes happening. And all this is set in the context of like this amazing orchestration that he produced and this live dance from like around the world and everything. And you get this whole sensory experience so that it's not just a matter of your intellect being engaged by some figures. It's like your senses are being immersed in this really, this really profound experience. And uh, so I think this is an example of the way that art can communicate to people, move people when the figures don't. I didn't talk about this in my talk, but in some talks, um, there is a distinction between different um, types of creativity. Um, Dietrich talks about um, knowledge domains and uh, cognitive versus uh, um, um, emotional cognitive domains. And that ties into what you're talking about, where you can talk to people in the cognitive domain or you can communicate ideas in the cognitive domain. Um, until sometimes you're blue in the face, but you do, people work with heuristics and people work with kind of shortcuts and sometimes you have to communicate and you should communicate uh, across those domains in order to get your message across regardless of what the message is. And, and working with the knowledge domain and the uh, emotional domain, the arts and the sciences uh, will often prove more fruitful in the long term if you have an important message to convey than either of them I, I, I'm not a believer on this one. Um, I, I don't think art and science actually have a lot in common. Um, <coughs> the, the constraints under which the two sets of disciplines are practiced are, in fact, entirely different. Um, we, we've gone through a period of everybody saying very loudly that art and science have to collaborate and work together and we're all really the same thing. And having spent the last 40 years with one foot in one camp and the other foot in the other camp, I promise you <laughs> that they're two very different camps. Let me be clear, I'm not saying they're the same thing. <clears throat> I'm saying that they, they, they can convey two different parts of similar messages. And, and it's an important part, it's important to get the two sides of that message conveyed. So I'm not saying they're the same thing at all. No, no, I didn't say, no, I, what I said was that they function under different sets of cons constraints. Definitely. Um, science um, has to pay attention to what is known already. Yeah. Art doesn't give a damn about what's known already or doesn't have to. That's um, awesome. yeah. the, 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 func <laughs> the, 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 the role of the artist is to go with, you could say of both that the, the role of the individual is to go where the imagination leads. Um, but in, in the one case, the imagination is limited by what we know already about the field, and in the other case, it's, it's for, up for grabs. The, w we've seen, uh, ever since Leonardo magazine was published 50 years ago, there's been this move to try and get artists and scientists to collaborate on this and that. There hasn't been one single satisfactory outcome from that because they don't really talk the same language and don't have the same functions. So I'm, I'm out of it, <laughs> as, far as, that, as far as that's concerned. I guess it's a matter of definition, but if you consider technology as part of science, and I think it's clear that science in that sense can facilitate creativity. I mean, nowadays we have 
the ability to be a filmmaker or a, or a composer or a, a visual artist right there on your laptop. So uh, I think in today's world, at least there is that connection between, between science and art. Well, the, the existence of technologies that are easy to pick up so that anybody can be a filmmaker doesn't make everybody a filmmaker. True. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but, but it, it gives more people the... Wouldn't you say it gives more people the opportunity, though, to see if they are filmmakers? Well, in, in, the, in the simplistic sense that you can... Uh, you, you don't need $100,000 to set up as a filmmaker. Um, you, can, you can get by with your, with your telephone, if it comes to that. Um, and we see a lot of that on, on the web, of course. Um, everybody, everybody's making movies about their cat. <laughs> but I, I, I don't see that making any real um, dent um, professionally. I mean, I, I think it's cute to watch all that stuff, but I haven't, maybe too early. We, we haven't yet seen anybody graduate <coughs> from that domain into, hate to say it, serious filmmaking. Has creativity transitioned over the course of history? Right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 and what's the difference between creativity and innovation? Yeah. And what's the difference between creativity and innovation? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants that. Do they have a <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, our question? <laughs> It's really fascinating that our brains haven't changed that much in the last 10,000 years. And at the beginning of it, we were making these pretty crude hand axes and painting um, cave paintings. And now we're doing these iPhones and uh, different kinds of uh, creative endeavors that are more technologically driven. Um, so one is creative and one is innovative. Um, I think we have the same or very similar brains, but there's been a, uh, a, an, a an accumulation of, of knowledge and uh, communal type of um, residue over time that has built up that um, has changed the product uh, over time in, in very meaningful and important ways from these hand axes, <laughs> these very basic hand axes to uh, you know, Pixar films. I, I think this is... Um, a really profound change. I don't know that much has changed in the mechanism if you get down to Dean Keith Simonton's definitions and to the, the formula, but the, the product has, has changed rather dramatically. Um, so I guess I don't really see a difference in kind between creativity and innovation. I think of innovation as a specific form of creativity that gets called innovation because it's got a direct practical uh, application. Um, so it sounds, it sounds like it's you know, business innovation, medical innovation, technological innovation, that all sounds fine. Um, to describe what an artist is doing as innovation sounds a little bit more strained. Um, I think that's just because, uh, until, until we think of the artist as doing something that's supposed to be right. So, um, yeah, so I just, you know, I think of innovation as creating a really practical purpose. Um, on the question of uh, how technology has changed our creative efforts, I think there's an interesting kind of, uh, it's a two-edged sword in a way. So our technological developments enable us to be creative in ways we couldn't have before. So, um, you know, having a computer opens up entirely new domains for creativity, like, 
I can now try to exercise, create, like try to come up with a new program or a new app or something like that. Right? These are new opportunities for creativity that just didn't exist before. But at the same time, having a computer also means that I don't need to be creative in ways that I used to. Because a lot of the things that I had to come up with my own solutions for before are now automated by some technological device that's easily at my disposal. Um, so there's, you know, the, it enhances creativity, it makes opportunities for new creativity, but technology also relieves us of the burden to create as well. So I think there's these two dynamics going on. Yeah, in interesting um, switch here. I think earlier we were talking about innovation as one of the one aspect, one characteristic of um, creativity. And now we're asking, you know, how have they changed? Um, I, I, I have to agree with you quite strongly that uh, as far as the, the brain is concerned, nothing has changed, or very little. If you look back at the um, cave paintings in Altamira or Lascaux, the, the level of, I mean, how, not, not only the, the level of perception of the, these great thundering beasts, but the circumstances in which they're being done, flat on your back, working on the roof of a cave, the spitting color, yeah. right? And you look at these things and you, boy, I wish I could do something like that. <laughs> no, no, I, I think to the degree that what we're talking about is a product of the, the, the brain, I don't see that anything has changed that very much. Mm -hmm. Um, in thinking about the relationship between innovation and creativity, um, I was thinking about some of the great composers in Western classical music. I'm, I'm kind of passionate about classical music. And if you look at composers like Bach, and Mozart, and, and Beethoven, they're all incredibly creative people, they, they created great works of art, but they're not all equivalent in terms of innovation. Beethoven was an incredible innovator. Most critics, I believe, would argue that Bach was not. Bach was a culmination of a tradition. And, and so he worked within existing forms and raised them to an incredible level, where, where Beethoven was the iconoclast. So, you have extremely high levels of creativity, but I think different kinds or, 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 or different degrees of innovation. I think that's, that, 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 that's another possible relationship between the two. Now for our last question, we before we open it up to the floor. In your respective field, what do you think is next in the study to further our understanding of creativity as linguists and neuroscientists? Could you repeat that again? What do you think is the next big thing we would study to further our understanding of creativity in your respective fields? What, what, what? what is the next big thing to further our understanding of creativity in our fields? The new educational system. <laughs> Yours? Yeah. I second that. <laughs> I'm, ser I'm serious. Like, so the first question um, was about uh, where creativity is most needed. You know, what domain to be. Yeah, and then, I, well, I didn't answer that question, but if I did, I would have said education. Because I think everything else we can think of is, um, is in a way secondary to that, because you have to prepare people um, with, you know, the right education, with the right mindset, with the right skills, with the right open-mindedness and so forth to solve all those other problems. And all of that begins in you, it begins with education. So definitely, tackle that. Um, and I guess in my own field, so speaking about philosophy, I think um, 
I mean, what I, what I tried to illustrate with the, the talk I gave this afternoon was that um, the contribution of philosophy can make uh, to these discussions is to contextualize uh, the data that we find in the sciences and to, to, to make it meaningful in the context of questions that have always been of interest to us as human beings. So the question that was driving in the talk I gave was the question of like, how should we live and uh, what kind of person should I be and so forth. And it was a long story, so I won't repeat it here. But, um, but, I, but I think that you know, connecting the, the very fascinating scientific data with these broader humanistic questions is, is part of the way forward as well. Were, um, this would be the most opinion thing, opinionated thing I say. I think we're making a huge mistake <laughs> um, in terms of education. I think we're doing uh, things absolutely wrong. Um, we are stuffing information into our brains, and we don't have the time to imagine how the world could be, uh, to do those simulations, to do that, to have that downtime. And I think from a neuroscience perspective, if we could understand how people imagine, how people do those simulations, how people do visualization, the, the, the uh, thought experiments of Einstein. I mean, how do people imagine how the world could be as opposed to being steeped in such information overload about how the world is? I think that's the clearest path forward that we could possibly see. <laughs> As I mentioned in my talk this morning, one of the most rewarding things about having created uh, the Navi language is that a community has arisen where people who never had been interested in language before are now developing an interest and in many cases sort of a passion for it. And I think if we can somehow through education encourage the kind of passion kind of passion for artistic pursuits, for intellectual pursuits. Not sure exactly how we can do that, but I think that's what's needed. Elliot, in, you, in your talk this, uh, this afternoon, you mentioned the notion that we are what we love. You know, getting people to love creativity, I think is gonna go a long way to, 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 to foster it. Yeah. So the question, I believe, was does our language limit our understanding of the world, the way we are in the world, our communal sense? Was that, was that kind of question? Yeah, okay. So you've touched on uh, a widely discussed topic in linguistics. It actually has a name. Uh, and the name is the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which was very popular around the 1940s. I see some people smiling, you're very familiar with this. This was the idea developed by an American linguist, Benjamin Whorf, that we are, in a sense, prisoners of our native language. That our native language imposes a way of looking at the world, which we really, whether it's time, whether it's relationships, something that we can't escape from. Okay. Uh, there are very few people today who will uh, accept that very strong version of the superior war hypothesis. However, there is sort of a, a new version. One of the proponents is a linguist named uh, Guy Deutscher, who's written a very interesting book called Through the Language Glass, which accepts the fact that we are not limited in the sense that our language is a prison, but develops a very interesting notion that 
in very subtle ways, our native language can, in fact, have an effect on how we perceive the world. To give, uh, to, to give an example, um, as everyone knows, there are languages that, unlike English, must assign a gender to inanimate objects. Okay. So in uh, the word for fork in Spanish is el tenedor, masculine. In French, it's la fourchette. It's feminine. OK, now, does the fact that your language perceives something in a, in, in a masculine gender or in a feminine gender that's inanimate, does it have anything at all to do with the way you look at the world? Well, you see, of course not. It's simply grammatical. But it turns out that there are very subtle ways that have been discovered where people are influenced. There was an interesting experiment where they took different groups of speakers and uh, showed them a cartoon fork, an animated fork. And they said, this is going to be in a new kid's movie, and we need an appropriate voice for this fork. And here are a number of choices. Well, guess what? The Spanish speakers, on a much greater than chance level, chose a masculine voice. French speakers chose a feminine voice. Okay, and th this to me is extremely interesting and unexpected, the fact that our language can influence us in ways that we aren't even aware of. So, so, so I, th I, th I think the, the answer to your question is language can influence our being in the world, but it doesn't have to define our being in the world. We, we can get beyond that. basic question is, should I uh, specialize or be uh, uh, a polymath? <laughs> well, it's less of a personal question, but more of a, to generate creativity. Yeah, to generate creativity. And, and well, the easy answer is, I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> the, 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 my, my opinion is, uh, I think both. I, I think it's really, and based on, on, on some of the evidence, you, you do need to have some specialization in one thing. Uh, but the evidence also shows that um, people that go beyond that level of uh, their own experience into other areas are able to produce more creative ideas because they're linking it to more uh, different things outside of their own domain. So you do have to have a specialization. You do have to have some expertise in one domain. But uh, going beyond that domain is, is also uh, important, I think, uh, to produce uh, more novel and useful uh, original, surprising uh, ideas. If you're stuck in that one domain, you're not going to produce uh, as much novelty as otherwise would be the case, or anything surprising for that matter. Uh, so I think it's a little bit of both. I think is is going to be important. You do have to have that that expertise. You can't just be you know one inch deep and a mile wide. That's not going to to produce anything particularly useful. But you also can't drill down a mile deep and not have any view of the of, of the outside world from your your, your precious little bubble uh, as well. I think it, it, it has to be a combination of those two. Uh, yeah, so I think what, what Rex was saying is totally right. Um, but just aside some of the common data that's uh, connected with this point. Um, so there's something famously called a tenure rule, which isn't really a rule, it's actually an average. The point is that people take an average of 10 years of 10,000 hours of deliberate practice in a domain before they make a really significant contribution to it. Um, and that makes sense, because you do have to sort of in, internalize a sense of what actually works and what you're doing. You have to develop a certain skill that you can, you can as mentioned in the talk before, uh, that you can draw on as sort of part of your repertoire, even when you're improvising. Um, and, but at the same, so that's a sort of specialization angle. And at the level of uh, diversifying, you also find historiographical um, findings from these maps naturally. Um, that the greatest scientists and people also had often had artistic hobbies and, and so forth. So they're, 
they were brought as well to be. <laughs> Conscious processes play in creativity. Bringing. Okay, so the question was about the role of consciousness in creativity and incubation being understood as a process with, in which you're not consciously attending to the problem, uh, problem, and then that's followed, if you're lucky, by a moment of illumination where the thing just ah occurs to you. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, that's a very common sort of set of stages in the creative process. Um, a lot of people have written about that just from sort of anecdotal point of view, and there's a lot of research um, on what's actually going on during the incubation process. I'll just report a relatively new finding about the role of consciousness. Um, this is from Roy Baumeister and colleagues, and the findings are actually published in uh, the book that my colleague Scott and I edited, Philosophy and Creativity. Anyway, let me play. So, um, so here's the finding. Um, so he's, he's saying, uh, he, he was calling to the study where they got people who were pretty expert um, guitar players, jazz guitarists, to improvise. And then one group was told to just go ahead and do their thing, and the other group was told that they had to do like this counting backwards activity at the same time. So they go 1,993, they count back by seven, uh, 996. Whatever, 86 or 86, it's already hard. And, so, and um, so the thought was uh, the second group wouldn't be able to consciously attend to their activity as much as the first. They'd have these resources diverted to it. And then, according to a certain you know, kind of stereotype of the creative process, um, consciousness gets in the way. You're supposed to like, you know, liberate yourself from consciousness and just sort of let it happen or something like that. But what they found was actually the opposite the people who were consciously had all of their. Um, attention devoted to the task performed better in the interpretation. Um, so in a way that's not surprising, but I think like the, the insight that people have that like your consciousness can get in the way wasn't consciousness uh, in the sense of just attention to the task, but something like self-consciousness. It was like your internal critic. Um, that's what needs to be silenced, not your attention altogether. I, I, I suspect that both play a very active role, and one doesn't always choose which one one is using. I, I'm inclined to think that a, a lot is more conscious than one normally believes. Looking from outside, um, it frequently seems that the, in my case, the artist um, is doing something very peculiar and unexpected. From inside, it merely looks like a rational response to a very obvious problem. Uh, it's just that the only person who sees the problem in the first place is the guy holding the brush. Um, a lot of the time, I, I'm you know, talking from my own experience now, a, a lot of the time I know perfectly well why I'm going, what I'm going to do and why I'm going to do it. Sometimes I find myself saying, oh, look what I did. I didn't know I was going to do that. Um, something happened that was unexpected. I, I can record what I privately think may be the um, single most creative thing I've ever done, which was waking up one morning um, after a full year of trying to puzzle out how you could persuade a computer program without vision to handle colour. And after banging my head against a wall for a full year, I woke up one morning with a complete program already in my mind. Um, didn't really believe it, but the little voice said, well, it wouldn't hurt to try it. So I did, and it worked. And to this day, I don't really understand why it worked. Um, so I, I, I guess I do have to accept that the unconscious plays a very large part or can play a very large part yeah. in all that. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would add to all that is that 
I found from my own experience and from listening to what other people have said that the incubation period only works if you really have put in a lot of conscious work well, at the beginning. Quite. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it doesn't work if you just dabble with something yeah. for an hour and say, well, I'll just give it a, a month and come back and I'll have the insight. No, you won't. You really have to kill yourself yeah. in the beginning, put it aside, and then you may have the experience. Quite. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll have our um, last question. Sure. So, um, most of the discussions of creativity, maybe all actually, of the creative process in this conference, have talked about individual creativity, right? So the creativity of a, of a the creative process of one person. Um, I'm wondering to what extent uh, you all think that creativity can actually be real, the creative process can be realized by a group's collaboration, like a, a lab, a scientific laboratory, or a group of screen didn't get it. To what extent can creativity be realized by a group? Mm. As opposed so to I think this is a really important and good question. And, and yes, the, the focus has been on the individual. But uh, if you think of uh, the Beatles, uh, for example, or uh, you know, musical groups um, that have split up subsequently, the music is, is good, but it's not as great as the Beatles, you know, that, that, that pulled this group of individuals together that really did create something of, of work of genius. Um, and, and there's something in that interplay of those individuals that's almost like I, the analogy of like neurons working in, in synchrony. Individual neurons are kind of like this amazing thing, but when you put them together into a, a, a cortical column or a, 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 a brain, um, it really starts to hum, hum together. So I, I think that's a really important concept. And, and then it function, people, it, when a group is functioning well, it can function like that brain of a novelty generator and blind variation and selective retention. And the gentleman from uh, Pixar, uh, from Disney, uh, spoke about this, when, when individuals can, can really do that creative process well, um, where the, the, the novelty generation and selective retention are in dynamic opposition and one is not uh, superseding the other, uh, then, the, then the creative groups are going to put out great creativity and that can happen in screenwriters, that can happen in uh, musical groups, that can happen in scientific laboratories. Not often, um, but uh, you, can, you can see that, that, that delicate interplay of blind variation and selective retention in, in exquisite uh, dynamic opposition. Um, yeah, I think that's right. I would add to that. We saw there are cases where like the group dynamic is very obvious. I mean, in con context of say uh, jazz improvisation, you know, you've got people playing together and playing off each other. Um, but even in the cases where it looks like we're talking about individual creativity, the role of others is always behind the scenes, playing a you know very important part. Chomsky says, no one, everyone in science knows like no one gets anything done on their own. He famously said that he saw as far as he could because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. He's talking about Galileo and so forth. So, so Are you, you saying know, no man is an island. No, yeah, I guess I am. Yeah. So I think there's there's sort of group creativity behind the scenes, even in the cases that look like salient examples of individual. I'm actually involved in uh, an experiment in group creativity right now. Uh, in terms of <laughs> expanding the vocabulary of the Nahi language, uh, originally people in the community were sending me requests for new words. Please give us a word for this, 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 this. Uh, what I realized at some point is that there are some people who are so knowledgeable about the language, aware of the constraints of what can be a word, what can't be a word, really devoted so much time and effort to the language that they can not just request vocabulary, but actually propose vocabulary. And so now at this point, um, the expansion of Navi has become somewhat of a community effort. Uh, there's a whole hierarchy, there's a committee, there's a rotating chairmanship, I get a document every month with not just requests for vocabulary, but suggestions. What about this new word? What about that new word? And it, seem, it seems to be working. What's not clear to me, though, is in a group creative activity, can it be 
completely democratic. I mean, we have this term creative differences. And when you have creative differences in a group, it seems to me there has to be some sort of overall presiding authority. In this case, I'm the authority. I'm the only one who can say this word is in the language, that word is not in the language. But uh, with that in mind, the group creativity seems to be working pretty well.